one uh, it's eleven fifty nine. Yes. So a lot of times people join right noon. Get started shortly. All right. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, uh, first off, thanks for joining this third session of Arts and Resilience, sponsored by UT Wellness and the McGovern Center for Humanities and Ethics. I am super excited to get to introduce uh, Patrick McGrath Vinice. Um, he is an artist from Puerto Rico. He works primarily with oil paintings on canvas and retablos. His work is inspired after old master and Spanish colonial paintings while addressing issues such as colonialism, consumerism, climate change, and global pandemics, so very timely. Um, he's had solo shows everywhere, um, including San Juan, Antigua, Guatemala, Arizona, and even Fort Worth, Texas. Um, he also has works um, at or shown at the Bronx Museum in New York, the Spanish Colonial Arts Museum in Santa Fe, and then um, locally the Station Museum and the Holocaust Museum. He obtained a BFA in Fine Arts from the School of Fine Arts at San Juan in Puerto Rico in 2003 and an MFA from the Savannah College of Art and Design. Um, you can find his works in uh, private collections all over the US, Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Um, and interestingly, his work is even in the private collection of the Chairman Emeritus of the Smithsonian National Latino Board, Henry Munoz, in uh, 2017. This is where I actually, I first saw Patrick give a talk, um, which was loosely related to um, an incident where he had his studio and um, work and home were really impacted in Puerto Rico. Um, and so I got to see some of that and I heard him talk um, about that. And it was really interesting. So I'm happy to say he's a local um, and uh, invited to speak today. So I look forward to him um, sharing. So Patrick, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Anson. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity and the, and the privilege to be here spending the hour with you guys and sharing my work. Um, thank you, Alma. Thank, uh, thank you, Keisha. Uh, and everyone who is attending this uh, presentation, I'm going to be showing you a slide presentation, which is basically a summary of like past 12 years of my work that mostly involves oil paintings, like the ones that you're seeing in the back here. These are all oil paintings on canvas, oil paintings on panel. Some of these panels are triptychs, altarpieces. They have gold leaf in it. They are, some of them are triptychs. And I'm also gonna be talking about my latest project, which is a tarot. And I will explain why tarot. There's a whole story to it, a backstory to it. And that tarot is the tarot, uh, tarot neocolonial de las Americas or neocolonial tarot of the Americas. It'll be published by US Games. That's gonna be coming out soon this year. I'll have all the information and details uh, for that at the very end of this talk. And uh, I'm going to be talking, of course, about climate change and many of the the issues that in, are involved in my work. There's a lot more to it, of course, uh, the content, the issues. But I'm also going to be diving into some of the techniques that I use in order to uh, create these paintings. And the formal aspects is, you know, the creative process behind it. We'll finish with a very simple activity that you can all do at home with very basic tools that you can find at your uh, at your convenience. You'll need like a pencil, uh, paper, an eraser, a sharpie if you have it, but a, a, a thick black pen will do, and a ruler. So it's a very simple five minute exercise we'll do at the very end and and, and we'll follow that with a Q&A for the presentation. Many of these paintings, as I was mentioning, I was telling Anson, uh, might take me just an hour to talk about them. And I have many paintings to share. So I'll try to be as brief as possible, but to cover as much uh, uh, ground as possible. So if you have questions at the very end, we can go back to the slide or the image that you might be interested in talking about. And that also at the very end, I'm gonna share with you my website and, and you can you can go and, and 
explore on your own and, and take your time because there's much to explore and, and discover in each one of these paintings. So um, let's dive into it, uh, shall we? Let's see, I have to share content and you'll let me know if you can see. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen and uh, let's get started with this. Okay, can you all see the, uh, I don't know if Anson can. Yes, uh, we can see it, it looks okay. perfect, you're good. Okay, okay, thank you. I just mm -hmm. wanted to make sure. Okay, so let's uh, get started with this first painting here. Uh, this is titled The Vessel. And I painted this back in 2015. And this was uh, one of the first paintings I did when we moved here to Houston, Texas, my wife and I. My wife is from El Salvador, and uh, as Anson said, I'm from Puerto Rico. And uh, we lived in different places, Florida, Georgia, before me mo finally moving and, and settling here in, in Texas. And this, this was one of the first paintings I did. We, we, we moved here in 2014. This painting I did in 2015, a year later, is the biggest painting I've done uh, so far, uh, 48 by 72 inches. And if I had to pick a single piece that summarizes all of my work and has all the elements that define and describe my work, this would be it. So uh, you, you can see there's, in, I'm taking inspiration from art history, from Spanish colonial art specifically, from Catholic iconography, tarot, alchemy, there's mythology, and there's even pop cultural references here. Uh, as you can see, but it is ultimately responding to, you know, social and environmental concerns. I use this uh, uh, motif of the vessel or the boat or the, the ship of fools as a recurring element because I find it quite appropriate as a metaphor for the times that we're living in. As you can see, um, I don't know if uh, you can see the arrow on the screen pointing to this figure here that is masked and is, uh, is opening a book. Uh, this is pre-pandemic. This was 2015. Uh, but that is something that you'll see in my work a lot, like a lot of things, like in The Simpsons, <laughs> it's sort of uh, uh, have this prophetic quality to it, but, but because these things have happened before, so it's not hard to predict either. Uh, so, before we move on, I should talk a little bit about my, my backstory here, where I'm coming from and what's the perspective uh, I'm, I'm, I'm taking with my work. So I grew up in, in Puerto Rico. Uh, it's a small island in the Caribbean during the 1980s and, and 90s. So I, I spent most of my childhood and youth years there. So those experiences are, are, are the ones that are informing my work that this colonial experience not many people know this but puerto rico is the oldest colony in the western hemisphere since 1508 uh it was settled by by the spanish before that the, the native tainos were living peacefully in the island till the spanish came and then in 1898 it was occupied by the u.s during the spanish uh american war and it was uh it was taken as war booty. To this day, it's a non-incorporated territory of the U.S. and a, a commonwealth, but most people know that that is really to say it's a colony. So despite uh, us being uh, American citizens and having uh, uh, American passports, we can travel freely from the island to the mainland it still remains a colony for the reasons that you, we cannot vote for the president. We cannot, we have very little or no representation in Washington and all the important uh, political and economic decisions in the island are made in Washington. So it's not like it's a state, it, it's not. Uh, we have, uh, we, we don't, we have a very limited array of, of options in that, in, in that context. And, uh, 
given the financial crisis, which started in early 2000s, many people fl fled the island. It got even worse after Hurricane Maria. Uh, but despite that all, it's a highly consumerist society. Not many people know this, and it's a fun, f well, I don't know if it's a fun fact, but it it's an interesting fact that it's the country with most cars per square mile and also the most Walgreens pharmacies per square mile. Uh, it's quite intense. It's a small place with a lot of concrete. Uh, of course, you see, and, and it's true that it has one of some of the most beautiful beaches in the Caribbean, and there's much to it be explored in terms of nature. But I've seen much of it uh, been sadly destroyed by progress and and all these uh, strip malls and, and highways and construction. And my work is responding to that. Um, it, it's primarily informed by all of those experiences. So this is a painting that's uh, that I did back in 2010. It's entitled De Uscurrimiento. It's 50 by 38 inches. And I did this when I, I, I went back home. Uh, so the 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 idea of of looking back at hi at history is not new in in in, in art and, and history painting has a long tradition but this historical perspective is really uh quite unique when it's it's, it's seen through a colonial lens uh, when you look at back at the time of of uh, columbus arrival to the new world uh, regardless of what you think of columbus and the european uh, conquest of the Americas, this could easily be uh, called the most important event in human history. Why? Because it's the dawn of the global capitalist consumer era, the, uh, the time that we're living in right now, what many call the Anthropocene, because of the large industrial uh, scale uh, uh, impact that he, that humans are having on the environment, on the planet. And it uh, all started with this uh, transatlantic Colombian exchange. The world got smaller. And as a consequence, uh, many world cultures in the Americas and in the Pacific and in Africa and elsewhere were impacted by this, by this single event. And, and the environment is, is just one of those uh, uh, victims. Uh, so basically what I'm, I'm arguing about, but my work with my, my central thesis is that, uh, our current neo-colonial corporacy really has its roots in colonial times. And, and, and that's, that's what you're seeing here. It's a recurring theme in my work, the figure of Columbus, uh, but also incorporating other, uh, uh, other figures from history and, and pop culture. And that is the reason why I'm adopting techniques and visual devices that are appropriate to that time, because I really want to emulate the Renaissance and spirit and, 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 and the visual devices that, you know, such as classical allegories, Christian icons, and, all, and, and the composition and all that. And it's, and it's not just the Renaissance, it's the Baroque as well, because I really want to bring that to mind, that Everything that we're experiencing today uh, has its roots in that time. And, and of course, the use of satire, that, which you can see in, in a piece like this, and, and the anachronisms, uh, it, it, you know, that recontextualization of history is what's allowing me to you know, question these adopted capitalist doctrines, creeds, and consumerist habits that, we, that have really altered our appreciation and understanding of history, nature, and ourselves. So uh, a lot to talk about here. This is uh, The Chosen People. Uh, it was painted back in 2012. It's 24 by 47. This is, uh, you could call it an altarpiece. It has a lot of uh, foul gold leaf in it. And it's really inspired after this uh, recurring image that you would find throughout the Americas uh, during the Spanish colonial times. And it was a, an image that has many version, versions to it, but it's basically called La Nave de la Cristiandad or the Ship of Christianity. And you would have the saints 
the Catholic saints and, and the Virgin Mary on board a ship uh, with Christ crucified on a mast. And this is an allegory. That is to say a metaphor to the uh, Christian church. For me, I see it in these times, not much, not as much as about Christianity, but about uh, corporations. So I've substituted the saints by corporate mas mascots and, and, and these images that bring to mind our current consumer culture. So these are basically fictional, agenda-driven, untouchable, divine-like entities that are dictating the direction of our consumer society. Then you have the figure of uh, Santiago Apostol uh, Matamoros or uh, Mata Indios, uh, which is quite an ir irony, considered a saint, but he was an Indian killer, a Moor killer, and he was like the patron saint of the conquistadors when they came to uh, the Americas. And I had this was uh, this is an image that is quite popular throughout the Americas from that time. Uh, and I have my own version here, uh, incorporating other elements that, as I mentioned before, uh, have a lot to do with satire and using all these corporate icons, Burger King, McDonald's, and others. Uh, Jose Campeche painted this triptych, and it's at the El Museo, Museo de Ponce, Museo de Ponce in Puerto Rico. And it's a small triptych. It's uh, Our Lady of Mount Carmel. I love this artist. It's, he's one of my favorite painters, and he he's, uh, really inspired my, my work. This is my, my version of it, uh, of course, incorporating modern-day cartoons that uh, invoke this idea of, of uh, rich versus the poor, this vertical socioeconomic relationship between those below and those above and conquest and progress with the tank and the bulldozer on the side wings. And this image is by uh, Francisco Surbaran. It's Virgen de las Cuevas or Virgen de las Mercedes. Uh, and it's, it's a image that was quite influential in the Americas. This is a Spanish painter, but uh, much of what you see in Spanish colonial America uh, was influenced by images like this. And I have, again, my own version here. Uh, Virgen Protectora del, del, Comercio, del Libre Comercio, which is translated as the, the Virgin uh, Protectress of the Free Market. You have uh, all the people who are like farmers, the poor, consumers and corporations all alike under her mantle. So I'm using the language of allegories again to state that point of, of how these fictional uh, characters or figures or icons can have new meaning today. This image is quite recurring in the Americas. This is from the uh, museum in Santa Fe. Uh, it's an unidentified Mexican artist from the 18th century. This image is quite popular and recurring throughout the Americas, and I have my uh, own take on it. And this, this piece is titled The Seed. And uh, the more I started painting these uh, images of Madonnas and saints, the more I started to see a, a recurring pattern of archetypes. And you have the archetypal devil, the archetypal angel, the figure of death, the life giver or provider, who is the, the, the Virgin Mary in this case, and, and, and the self-portrait, which brings this notion of self-awareness. I'm mindful that I'm participating in this narrative and that this narrative is, in a way, uh, defining me. So now I'm seeing art as a mirror to the soul, as an antidote to this really intolerable collective amnesia that's affecting us all. Aided by the superfluous, distracted media through the uh, electronic devices, as you can see there, uh, there's a laptop right in front of me and the devil is trying to show me something there. Uh, this is really keeping us disconnected from reality, from uh, our appreciation and understanding of nature, spirituality and history and ourselves. 
So knowing thyself has become really my ultimate goal here. Um, but this has been a process. And this was showing at the Jung Center uh, in 2017, this piece. It's now in Aruba. Oh, and I skipped the piece here. I'm sorry about that. Uh, Madonna de la Barca de los Locos, um, inspired after that same image of uh, Our Lady of Mount Carmel. She's the patron saint of my hometown, Aguadilla, where I grew up. And also of, of fishermen and, and people who go on boat or travel on boat. And here you have a very contextualization of, of those new transatlantic entrepreneurs. And uh, here I'm exploring the, the, the archetype of, of the madman or the fool or a loco. And this, this painting is titled The Disney Rican Dreamer and it's inspired after my dear friend Cesar Villanueva who passed away uh, in 2020. He was not only my best friend, he was a mentor and a father figure and inspiration. He was also a painter, but he was, so full of imagination and a free spirit who is wandering, uh, uh, you know, going from place to place. That's why the inscription below you see, de aquí para allá, uh, de aquí para allá. It, it's like from here to there. And he, and he, he was not fixed to a place. And uh, that's why he's called the Disney Rican dreamer because he, he ended up uh, living and dying in, in, in central Florida. It's a sad story. I wish I had more time to talk about him, but he was very influential in my understanding of, of the world around me and all that. And you'll see that uh, he is a recurring uh, figure in my work as well. El Mago is inspired after the figure of San Martin de Porres and also inspired after the card, the magician in the tarot. And this is, uh, I believe it's like 24 by 47. It's oil on, on, on panel. Someone asked me there on um, uh, what the flying pig here implies. It inf implies this, this flight of fantasy or also when pigs fly. So alluding to the impossible, things that are impossible, that, that very much uh, represents his his way of seeing life in the world around him. Okay, there's this uh, uh, magical realism uh, uh, quality to it. <laughs> and Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz is a a very well known uh, historical figure in in Mexican history. She was a poet, a writer, a philosopher, a Catholic nun, uh, who inspired this this piece that I did. Uh, titled La Papisa or the Popis, which is also inspired after that same card in the tarot uh, that you can see on, on, on uh, above above her. And uh, she was also the f often con considered the first feminist in Latin America. So I'm finding quite a lot of inspiration in, in, in history, the tarot. So as you can see, all of these works and the works that I just showed you, the El Mago, Papisa, the Zurican Dreamer, or Loco, uh, are really inspired uh, after the, the tarot. Let's talk about the tarot for a bit. Uh, it was created during the time of Colum, which makes it a lot more relevant for me. This is the a sample of the tarot of, Ma of Marseille. So just think about this as a a, a really a, a visual tradition created, uh, uh, you know, under humanistic influences during the Renaissance. So it, it's reflecting on upon Renaissance culture, combining classical allegories and biblical references and occult symbolism, making it timeless, really, in, in a sense. It's pointing towards the future because, of course, that association with fortune telling is inevitable. You, you immediately think about it even though it was not created and with that purpose and originally that came much later but it has this its roots in the past as well in classical antiquity and i find these these archetypes uh, these especially the major arcana which you can see here on screen they're 22 uh, 
they have so much meaning and so many there's so many interpretations to them and i find them so rich visually and archetypally and that's what's informing uh, much of my work later on and i i i started to work on these wheels these moving wheels uh, uh searching for uh archetypal correspondences not just between not just with the tarot but with uh, uh, contemporary issues, Catholic saints, uh, astrology, uh, so many different aspects. And I found like quite, I, I became obsessed by it really. And, 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 but it was quite revealing to me, quite insightful. And, 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 and as a creative practice, it really opened many doors to uh, uh, new understandings of, of how to create new narratives. This, this painting here is uh, the revelation and it's, it's all about the, the vertical power relationships as I was mentioning on, on, on a previous piece, as above, so below, the people, the poor people on, on, on the earthly plane below uh, versus the people who are above in the clouds in the celestial realm. It's the colonizer, colonized relationship, which is projected onto like any belief system. And this piece is at the a Spanish Colonial Art Museum in Santa Fe. Oh, sorry. And uh, Corpus Christi and uh, is a uh, body of Christ. I'm using the the image of Christ crucified on a tree, and with the inscription "Eco," it's an allegory to Earth as uh, as a uh, as a as a Crif, uh, as a crucified victim of, of our actions or inactions in, in our current society. The animals that you see around the gray and gray are extinct animals that might have well been extinct because of our uh, uh, encroachment of, of the natural ha habitats or uh, just overhunting. And, and that became a central uh, aspect of my work. This was back in, I think it was uh, in 2016, if I believe, that I started to work more on these issues. I read this book uh, by Jual Noah Harari, Sapiens, and it was highly influential in, in, in the way I, I understand history and, and see how, how this relationship of man versus nature has played out throughout history. And then you have Christ here as a... Uh, uh, as a response to uh, the negligent response to the aftermath of uh, Hurricane Maria. And this is the people of Puerto Rico uh, uh, surviving after that storm, powerful storm, which was uh, so intense. No, no one has seen anything like that before. Uh, but there in the background, you can see the former president throwing the paper towels to the crowd. And uh, behind him, he has... Uh, different uh, characters from history that uh, sort of continue or, or, or just reinforce that idea of colonized and colonizer. Oh, and I should mention the objects that you see uh, around the frame, those are all painted, the, the paper towels, the flashlights, the batteries, and, and, and the spoons and toilet paper, all of that, uh, the, those are the things that FEMA supplied to the people months after, you know, people were uh, there uh, months bef uh, without electricity and, and without water and basic needs. And I should say, people, it, it's easy to forget um, more than 3,000 people uh, died after, because of that hurricane. And uh, again, uh, this piece here is uh, the disembarkment. I'm tying uh, the themes of manifest destiny with the, the, the so-called discovery. And you can see here how I align or put together the figure of Theodore Roosevelt, uh, uh, American president who led the Rough Riders through Cuba, the Philippines, and Puerto Rico during the Spanish-American War. I put him right next to Christopher Columbus, who I took the 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 portrait of joao uh, uh, uh bolsonaro the president of brazil as inspiration for this portrait by the way uh, for christopher columbus and it's uh, yeah you can see the badge 
that he's wearing on his arm and it's in the end it's it's corporations who benefit from what they did uh centuries before uh, jo uh george's predicament again it, this is a triptych about uh repeating that same recurring theme there man against nature uh, saint george was a catholic saint that you if you do a google search on him and, and look for images you would find him slaying a dragon in this case it's an alligator so it, it doesn't matter if it's a, if it's a dragon or what it is it's always the same uh, uh theme that is 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 recurring throughout time and when you close this triptych uh, here you have uh the six the sixth extinction well six extinctions starting from the ordovician to the devonian to the permian to the triassic cretaceous and then the anthropocene at the very end so all the uh, human activities that are uh happening at this stage here uh will have their consequences later on on the uh, far left you see fortuna who is the goddess of fortune or fate and on the far right, it's time, Father Time, Kronos, or Saturn. So we'll see in time what happens. And uh, the signification of the hero uh, is a piece that's at the Albuquerque Museum. It's 52 by 38. It's a fairly large piece. And it's about the appropriation of high culture by, by the corporate media, in this case, Disney, and, uh, and how they really strip strip these legends and stories and myths the myth of hercules in this case from its original meaning and they repackage and sanitize it ready for mass consumption so uh, i'm commenting on on how that is related to what's happening in the background you see on the far right there there's uh, diego de landa or one man responsible for the destruction of most of the history of uh, uh, the Maya in Yucatan, because he, in just a single day, he burned almost all the sacred books and texts of the Maya, uh, because it was, you know, work of the devil. So I'm comparing those two acts, in a way. And uh, Adoración Capital is about how corporations with their advertisements and all consumer culture are taking uh, every aspect every inch of our culture our our society and spiritual traditions you can see the child there uh who is uh, posing there as a baby jesus he's not intended to be baby jesus by the way uh many people misread this painting but uh it's really about how our society is 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 really so disconnected and, and it's just uh with our screens and and we're just not looking at the whole picture and what's going on around us and and you have, have uh all of these characters are reflecting on 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 different brands and, and, and consumer products and uh corpus crucis uh, is about the social economic hierarchy that is is really uh um, defining us today and, and you have corporations with their BS, uh, bitcoins and dollars, uh, ruling over uh, families, servers, workers, farmers, and the ultimate sacrificial lamp, which is animals giving their lives for our pleasure and, well, our nutrition. I don't know. And Mother of Nine uh, is reflecting on this idea of the aftermath. Of, of earthquakes and floods and much more intense storms because of climate change. And I've been doing this a lot lately. And I'm also interested in, in, in the idea of prophecy or looking, looking into the future. This painting, for example, the Luvium was painted a month before Hurricane Harvey hit Houston. And if you have a closer look, you can see there's a flooded cityscape inspired after uh, 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 one of these, you know, scenes where you see the bypasses and, and, and highways in Houston. But you can also see that there's a masked, well, there's actually two masked figures uh, pre-pandemic, because, of course, we had had uh, several uh, pandemics before, not as strong as this one, but 
it, it's you know it was almost inevitable that this was something that was coming and uh that was the turning point for me uh this is uh what you're seeing on screen is an image of the destruction that maria hurricane maria uh, hurricane category five left on the island that's the house of my aunt who lived right next to my studio uh that's what was left of her, of her house all the vegetation is growing after a few months because i had a chance to travel to go back to the island and see what was left and sadly my studio was lost uh my my mom's house which was right in front of it was lost i lost most of my work there still painful to this day uh but it, it also inspires me to make much better work but this is really sad and it just made the the whole issue of climate change a lot more personal to me uh because it, it just hit home uh this experience of personal loss really renewed my sense of responsibility to tell the story it it, it just i there's there was no way to avoid this subject this theme and uh luckily and for some reason some strange uh, cosmic reason one year right before that i was able to go to the island and and visit my mom who had suffered a terrible car accident and she was at the hospital and but thank god she made it out alive but we just didn't know i was staying at her house while going to visit her at the hospital and i found this old tarot deck which was my first tarot deck from 30 years ago and i brought it with me to back here to texas one of the very few things i was able to bring back with me before the hurricane hit and everything was blown away so for some reason this came into my hands and this was also the first tarot deck published by u.s gains this company that introduced uh uh tarot to the american public back in the 70s and it's the the company which i'm working with right now with jen kaplan the the daughter of Stuart kaplan who introduced the tarot uh, to the us and, and that when i told them their story my story they were compelled to say, yes let's do your deck because i feel like th this gave me more, a lot more reason why i wanted to make this deck it, it meant it was a lot more personal and during the time there in the island I, uh, that I it was brief for a few months and my mom was out of the hospital, thank God. But I was reflecting upon the brevity of life and death. And, and you have the memento mori, which is uh, really in Latin means, remember you must die. So you, you see this sad girl, there is, she's inspired after, uh, you know, uh, after my mom. And you have the figure of death behind her and, and the four of cups and i'm starting to explore all these themes put them together and also you have the traffic jam there with the inscription below that says Sin prisa, que tarde o temprano, todo el mundo llega. so, so it says there's no hurry sooner or later we'll all get there so maria is really this is also a large piece it's the, the same size uh, as the first piece that i showed you the vessel just that this one is vertical because this is 48 by 72 so it's quite large there's the tarot deck on, on, on in the sky the the tarot deck that i found that i i was able to retrieve from the house right before it was destroyed the house you see there is is that's my mom's house to the left uh that's how it was left and that's the car crash one year earlier on the on the right uh so it was one loss after another but at the same time there's this inscription in Latin, uh, semper, lucet, semper sol lucet post tempestate. Uh, so it means the, the, the sun always shines after the tempest. And this is a portrait of my wife while she was pregnant with our son, Francis, who was born a year after the hurricane. So there's, there's this uh, um, um, intimation of, of hope as well after after things have gone you know after the storm there, there there must be some light you see there is another masked angel and this was before COVID. oh i'm sorry i think i knocked this thing off for some reason uh let me get back to this sorry about that 
Can you see all see the slideshow again? Yes, uh, we can see it. Okay, sorry about that. I oh, I don't know what I'm trying. I'm going to go back to where I left. Uh, it, there's so much to talk about here. I'm try, trying to do the best I can with the time. And oh, okay, Diasporamos is inspired by both Harvey and and uh, and Maria. And that's the painting that you saw when I started talking. Uh, at the start of this presentation that was right behind me. I have it here in my home. And uh, it, it's about this uh, response and aftermath and, and how people deal with loss, you know, in, in so many ways is, uh, and, and, and how ha they have to all in a way stick together and find a new home in, in many cases and, and redefine, which def redefines their own identities, their cultures, their societies and all that. And of course, we we cannot es escape a Starbucks because uh, they're everywhere. You see them there on the. It's uh, there's a destroyed sign there on the upper left. Oh, the meaning. Someone asked me the. Uh, and sorry that it, some some questions that they're just so fast that I I cannot read them quickly enough to answer them. Trans aquas turbulentas diasporamos is through. Uh, turbulent waters we are dispersing or migrating because many people migrated to the mainland US after uh, after they lost their homes in Puerto Rico. Alba's dream is inspired after uh, Harvey in Houston. There is this picture of this girl carrying a dog, saving this dog and, and also my cousin Alba in Puerto Rico was helping these animal shelters rescue stray and abandoned pets and the aftermath of the hurricane because many people had no choice but to leave their animals behind and it was really sad and but she was doing everything she could to help these these animals and this is her dream there uh, my mom in front of her house with the card uh the tarot card of the last judgment which means resurrection and, and just lifting yourself up back you know resurrection and you have to move on. You, you, you have to deal with the loss, move on. And, and, and I find quite a lot of inspiration um, in her, in her story. And I just started to think about the tarot as a, as really as, as, as a personal narrative, you know, reflecting on all the myths and memories that I, I still carry with me. You know, this procession of archetypal themes is, is not only describing my own life, you know, uh, in three periods and, and three acts, but it's also a reflection of human history as well. It's, it's allowing me to really reinterpret uh, our current age from a, a holistic perspective, viewing the world really as, you know, inter uh, cyclically, cyclically interconnected, even with myself. The, the morning initiation, that first row of, of the major arcana, those are the primary archetypes, starting with the magician, card number one, uh, to the chariot, uh, to the left. Uh, this is really a an allegory to a life itself. From the beginning, you play with your toys, you're a child, then you're, you're also nurtured and, and by, by grandparents, your parents, father, mother figure, university, institutions, schools, you fall in love, and then independence. And that really represents for me, at a personal level, my life back in the island. And uh, uh, the Wandering Eve is really uh, this equilibrium middle role of the major arcana, the tarot, starting with uh, justice and finishing with temperance. And it's really about this inner equilibrium that we're all looking for in our lives, trying to define who we are. And we are not in a fixed place. We're moving from place to place, from job to job. And that really describes much of my life and from 2004 to 2014. And back when I when I moved to uh, Texas in 2014, for me, this was the last row of the major arcana, starting with the devil and ending with the world. It, it's just very esoteric in, in meaning. And it, it just, uh, it, it's very introspective. And that's how I feel right now with the, the whole uh, pandemic and, and being isolated. It pushes you towards introspection and looking into yourself, looking deep into your soul, what's going on. 
interestingly enough, it, it is, uh, uh, I don't know if it's a coincidence, but it, it's quite interesting that my palette corresponds to three rows as well. And I, I do this all the time. I'm working with uh, three rows of value scales, which we'll uh, talk about a little uh, later with the activity that we have in mind here. I'm mixing all these colors on my palette. This is a closed palette, meaning that I already have all my colors pre-mixed. When I paint, I don't waste time mixing colors. They're already there on the palette. But uh, I find an interesting connection there between that and the three rows of the major arcana. Also, another uh, habit that I have and I, I, I've really invested my time is in, in a drawing journal. And I draw every day. I try to draw every day starting at 5 a.m. That's the first thing I do in the morning. So uh, this is a preliminary sketch for one of my next paintings, St. Sebastian as a patron saint of the plagues or you know, whenever there's pandemics and you have all these zoo zootopic diseases originating from these animals and in, in our uh, in interaction with them. And this is, again, my friend Cesar. And uh, I have many drawings of him. And he was the one who introduced me to the tarot. Yeah, uh, he, he introduced me to the tarot and, 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 and that was quite significant for me. And, and this is titled uh, El Profeta, The Prophet. He was often called El Loco or, or, or the crazy one in El Barrio and uh, because he believed and and UFO, he had these UFO sightings and, and all of those uh, UFOs in the background you see there are inspired uh, after some photos that of course I know that he used Photoshop for those. <laughs> no, he's not kidding me. But, but, but at the same time, there were some real UFO sightings. So in part, it was a joke, but at the same time, there were some really strange stuff because that we saw them together. And, and that makes it a lot more compelling for me because it's like it has this, this, this binary narrative to it, as Tarot has. Tarot, it, it, this is my, my, my project, Tarot Neocolonial de las Americas. It'll be published very soon, hopefully. Uh, uh, within months, uh, U.S. Games has has it already uh, for this year coming out. I started this in 2017. There's my friend again, Cesar. He's the fool. He's the cover of this uh, uh, of this tarot deck. These are some of the cards, as you can see. They are inspired after my paintings, and and many of the figures that you see in my work are in the tarot. And now it's it's becoming. Uh, symbiotic it's 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 feeding it, it's having a feedback loop loop with my work now it's going back uh and these are i'm going to show you some of my my work now this is more recent i think this was 2019 uh all american justice and it's all about migration and the injustice of the the, the allowing good goods and blocking people and this is the card Justice, which you could call injustice as well. It's like, uh, who decides what's justice, right? And, and uh, Homo sapiens, Banana Republic dictator is inspired after uh, this figure in, in the tarot. You can see the titles in the tarot and this tarot were in Latin. Now they we've changed them all in Spanish. And I thought that was a very good idea. Uh, this this came from the team at U.S. Games, and I thought it was a very good uh, suggestion. Uh, so you'll see all these Fortaleza o Justicia. They're all in Spanish. And so Tarot it has been really, you know, become my muse, my inspiration, uh, not only because it's it's bringing past and future together, you know, and, and in a way is is trying to foresee what what is to come but it, it, it's very ingrained and, and grounded into the past. Uh, this is titled Convivium. And we'll talk about the techniques. Uh, this is a painting by Alonso Cano, Immaculate Conception. I took this as an inspiration for this piece that I, I did uh, back in 2009. Uh, this is Virgen de los Remedios. And at that time we had the swine flu so that's why you still see like the masked babies on the on the right and the flying pig again. 
is alluding to the swine flu and, uh, and all this obsession of the media. And, and at that time, there is much information, not as much misinformation as today we have with this pandemic, but it was very much in the media. Um, and uh, this is how I had my palette at the time of that painting. So here I'm gonna be briefly discussing how I, I went about. I, I start with my row of grays going from the, the darkest dark, ivory black to titanium white. I do all these values up to 10, uh, sometimes 12. And then I do the same thing with these earth colors. And I start with my grays and then I, on, on the left, you see the grays, and then on the right, you see how I ended up glazing with color. I use these transparent films of color uh, to finish it. So it's basically, for me, my, 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 my guiding principles in art are drawing values and color. You can see it here in, in three images. So line work of course i have as i showed you my drawing journal i'm always practicing line work and drawing but the values are equally important and then finally the coloring so we'll go with the values as an exercise today so if you're ready we'll start with the video and uh i'm gonna see if we can open this and if you have pen and paper uh, get ready for this exercise. It'll be very quick. I have here a value scale of seven squares or seven rectangles, if you will, uh, starting with the darkest dark to just uh, white paper. I can use, uh, uh, th this pencil is the best, Stadler. Uh, the, you can use a Sharpie or a Micron Pigma, one of these thick uh, black pens, and you start using a ruler and dividing that and the these rectangles of, of uh, one inch each. Uh, it shouldn't be that hard. If you have all the materials, it's, it's something you can do in like what, five to 10 minutes. Of course, I'm doing fast forward here, but I started with the pen. I'm not using my finger to smudge the, the value. I'm using just the pencil, the pressure I'm, uh, I'm putting on the, on the paper here is what's making this so, so dark. A number two B would be ideal, a, a pencil to be. But if you have something darker, then, then uh, whatever works for you. Um, I'm trying to go lighter with the pressure on each subsequent square uh, rectangle and, and moving from left to right. And, and this is also a, 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 a very good exercise to do uh, uh, anytime, just as a contemplative me meditational tool that I find quite valuable. And uh, the more you do this, the, the better you get at it. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's really kind of tricky. You might have to go back to some of these. Uh, you might have to uh, uh, use an eraser. Uh, you might have one that should be lighter. Like that one is getting too dark. The one that's right next to the to the uh, blank, see, I'm using the eraser because I, I noticed that it was getting too dark. So I might have to, to go back to that, you know, fill it in until we have the final product there. That's that's a uh, value scale there, the end product. I, I, I did this one with holes and I used some transparent tape because through the holes I can, I can look at any object and find the right value. I did it with paint as well using raw umber and white and with the holes punched in there, I can also do the same thing. So that's basically the, the exercise we have here. Uh, uh, very easy, shouldn't take you that long. Uh, we'll get back to now the, the, the slideshow, but I think we can, we can just go with images like this. Uh, so this is the, the guide the title, the guide, and as you can see there, right, I think we should do the slideshow even though it's gonna, uh, I'll have to uh, skip through all these. Uh, it just looks better. Oh, wait, I could go like this, right? Okay, that's better, okay, there you go, okay. So that's the guide, that's a painting I did last year. 
And you can see right below me, I'm there right beside my son, Francis. And uh, this is a painting that is also reflecting on the memento mori theme that I talked about, reflecting upon death and the brevity of life. But this is also about life and death. And the value scale that you see on my color palette right below me is an allegory or a metaphor to that, going from the lightest light to the darkest dark, from black to white. And, and uh, so I find a lot of meaning to that. Uh, so that was inspired after this drawing that I did before that painting. And uh, those are all my inner demons, and, and, you know, uh, haunting me while I'm trying to concentrate in my drawing. And that is my website there. And it's uh, Patrick McGrath. Uh, art.com and uh, my work can be found at Evoke Contemporary in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, that's my gallery rep there. I also have a uh, gallery representation here in Houston at Heidi Vaughn Fine Art Gallery. And it, I don't offer any classes uh, as of now. I'm full time into my work uh, and and dedicating myself solely to painting. If you wanted to take a class, I think Laura Spector, I cannot think of anyone better than her as a teacher. As an artist, I have full respect for her. And I think she's really great. Um, and I'm actually expanding on that activity that I just showed you there. I'm really expanding on something that she already talked about on, on that previous lecture. So uh, if you have any questions, I think this would be the time for it. I'm I think according to my timer, I'm good with time. Uh, yeah. Any there recommended? A, uh, yes. Sorry. There was a question in the chat. Um, I went back. It's uh, could you discuss what inspired you to rethink religious icons in your art? What inspired me to revisit a religious icon? Okay. Uh, the religious icons are part of not beyond being part of the Christian uh, uh, visual legacy or tradition they are part of latin american culture so you have many towns many streets many many things that are associated with saints that are not necessarily you know associated it goes beyond the church and besides that there's a personal story that uh growing up in the island uh, uh my my aunt uh titi sister took care of me and she was a catholic nun retired so i was surrounded by these images from a very early age and uh, and it's just part of who I am. I grew up seeing these images everywhere. It's just it's so pervasive as as seeing McDonald's or seeing a Walmart. Uh, it's just part of the culture, the visual repertoire of the culture. Yeah. Faith has so a question have. about uh, doing. Do you have any recommendations on making a value scale with paint? Uh, uh someone I think asked me also about paints i there are several brands I, I i recommend gambling is one um trying to think of uh, winsor newton is is also very good i'm i i wouldn't go with the super expensive paints i would try to go with the medium i wouldn't go with the cheaper either uh, i would try to go with the middle range uh, uh not student grade paints because you avoid a lot of frustration believe me uh, and and i been doing this for some time and, and, and noticing the differences are huge and you spend a lot more time, a lot more money in the long run uh, uh, using cheap materials. So my suggestion is that you use good artist grade materials. Uh, you can use mat masonite, you can use uh, gesso board for the for the doing these value scales on 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 panel. Uh, and, and uh, using sable or synthetic brushes would be okay. And the, there's one other question about um, how long does it take to do one of your paintings? That was from Sandy. Oh yes, uh, how long, uh, like the first painting I showed you in the presentation, the vessel, which is also the cover of my website, that took me like six months, but that is the longest I've taken. The one in the background that you see here Diasporamus uh, might have taken me like a month and a half 
or something like that. And and the one that's right here, uh, Saul Guadu, it's a portrait would take less than that, like a month. But it depends because it's not just the painting. It's also like uh, preparing the idea, the sketches, preliminary sketches, research and all of that. So it varies from piece to piece. Awesome. Well, it is uh, one right at one. So um, if you have more questions for Patrick, feel, please feel free to stay on. But if you unfortunately have to leave, um, we will have his website and other information in his bio, because I know there was a question about like, galleries in Puerto Rico. So we'll have all of that updated on our website. But um, just want to thank Patrick for his time. Uh, it's really cool. He shared it's fascinating to me. He shared so much about his life um, because it's all in painting. And it's, I think we all really appreciated you being so open about so much of how that influences your work. Um, so thank you for that. And thanks to everybody else. Um, and if you have other questions, feel free to put them in the chat um, and we'll go from there. So thank you. Please. Thank you, Anson. Thank you everyone for, for being here. It's a real pleasure, real pleasure to be here. Yes. There's one question here that I missed. Someone asked something. So someone asked, here. can you explain how you add color glaze to the black and white? So how you started that process and what the glaze is? Oh, yes. The glaze with oil painting, you have to use a medium. And a, a medium, you could either buy a glazing medium that they're just pre-made. Uh, you can use uh, 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 a uh, half and half of linseed oil and turpentine. That's just the basic mix there for that, for glazing. And then you use very little pigment, like very little color. And and you go lightly over over your dried grisaille or gray painting. And then you have to use a, a, a soft a, a cotton cloth to rub out and wipe out all the brush strokes. So you're just leaving a very thin film of color. Uh, I would have to give you a demo too in order to like it, it, it's, it's easy to say and explain it but once you see it it's much better when you see it yeah it, it gives this illusion of being like a jewel like it, it just glows with color it's more intense um Keisha's asking if you have any advice for students or anyone who's wanting to develop their art skills uh well, I, I must say that this is the best time uh, for that, to, to develop your own skills. Right now, I, I wish at the, at the time that I went to art school, I wish I had all the resources that I have now, like on YouTube. Like right now, for example, I'm, I'm starting to do sculpture and I'm not really good at it, but there's so much. Uh, you, if you start Googling, if you start doing a research on, on YouTube, it's not hard to find very good classes. There's one site called Proko, uh, P-R-O-K-O, -O, Proko. I found out this like days ago and the, the guys there, the teachers are amazing and, and they teach you everything from drawing to painting to sculpture. It's just amazing how, how much resources we have right now online and that you, you don't really need to get into a huge student loan in order to study art, you can just, Proko, yes, exactly. That's that's it, and uh, it's amazing. Uh, we're living. I think this is the best time to be an artist, really, as a matter of fact, in terms of resources. Awesome. Well, thank you, Patrick. I think that might be it for questions. So we want to be respectful of your time as well. Um, yeah, so sure. Thank you so much. You. It's been awesome. Uh, I think you've gotten a ton of feedback. It's just all praise for your work in the chat. So thank you. Thank you to take a look. So. Right. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Awesome. And our next um, session will be in April, um, April 6th. So we'll see you then. Thanks. Okay. Thank you.